Hello, everyone. Welcome to Chat Channel. My name is Tim Hayden, and I'll be your host. We have a tremendous show for you today. Our guest is the talented and legendary Marie Cheatham. Ms. Cheatham is an actress known for, her, known for Heart of Dixie, Baskets, Days of Our Lives, Beetlejuice, Young Sheldon, Sam and Cat, and more. She's probably well known as Crazy Aunt Charlene Simpson on ABC's General Hospital. Please welcome Marie to the show. <laughs> Hello, Miss Cheatham. How are you? I'm wonderful. If I were any better, you'd have to pay money to talk to me. <laughs> oh, well, let's not do that now. <laughs> <laughs> I want to say Happy New Year. I know we're two months in, but it's still, it's been a pretty good year, I think, for me anyway. Oh, oh yes. Well, you know, I think every day is the start of a new year, frankly. <laughs> pretty much is. It gives you a brand new start. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll start like I normally do with other guests. I will ask you, what was it like for you growing up? Because you grew up in the beginning of things happening in Hollywood and entertainment. Well, <laughs> well, I don't mean that bad. I mean, I, I, I would have loved to. I mean, that's. Like... I know. <laughs> yes. Well, um, I had the absolute perfect childhood for an actress, meaning it was chaotic. <laughs> it was very chaotic. I am a single child. Well, single child. I'm the only child of two very brave people. Um, mother was Creek. Indian and American Indian and daddy was Choctaw and Scots Irish wow. and they got married as kids they met at a, a, a street dance you know and they got married and they were very young and uh, my father went off to World War II and was killed and is buried in Sicily I have been there to honor his memory a couple of times I've been to the graveside and my mother then was left as a teenager with a child and mm. she was stony broke poor they were wow. and in those days it wasn't very chic to be american indian it was um it was a denigrative term that they yes. used and mother could not get a job she had no education i grew up with her finger pointing at my face, you will go to college before you get married. You will go to college before you get married. Well, then she proceeded to get married uh, uh, several times. In fact, seven times. Now, two of them died. So that's, <laughs> well. she beat Elizabeth Taylor. <laughs> <laughs> but but um, it was kind of hard scrabble growing up. And mother would uh, go to school. She was always uh, after an education so she would work in the daytime or go to school at night and work in the night and go to school in the daytime but you know she had there was no child care there were there no places you know like child care today so she would leave me with people and uh they would take care of me so I learned at a very early age how to if you smiled and showed people your teeth they wouldn't hit you and I learned to go, you know, to a room, walk through the doorway and assess the room before I open my mouth, you know, because you, right, yeah. you have to find out what's going on. So all of this, I used to think was, oh, poor me. I had such a, <laughs> a terrible child. No, I'm sitting on top of a gold mine because I now play all of those people. I love playing the ones who were out of ignorance or just bad temper were kind of mean to me. I love playing those ladies because I kind of get back at them. Right. They're dead. I'm alive and I'm doing it. You know? <laughs> right. I, 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 so I mean, you're right. That is a goal. But, that is gold yeah. to tap into when mm -hmm. needed. And it's uh, uh, the study of human nature as survival as a child. Children do this automatically. You don't have to teach them. They just do it automatically. They figure out how they can get by and right. how they can get ahead. And uh, 
you know, they, they figure it out pretty early. So that was the childhood. And no, it, you have wonderful questions, sweetheart. But no, my family was not artistic. I mean, <laughs> I, uh, but they were, they were photographed with um, guitars and, uh, you know, everybody sang right. uh, and played some instrument in those days. But uh, n- there was no one in the industry when I... <laughs> That is far away. I mean, my uh, oh, this is a good story. Um, I was uh, before I was in school. uh, I, I, mother and I were on horseback ranching sheep in the middle of Texas, and she said, "Sister, what do you want to be when you grow up?" And she was expecting fireman or you know cowboy or something and I said, "I'm going to be a famous actress. I'm going to take you around the world." She said. (laughs) what are you talking about? You don't know anything about that. You haven't even <laughs> been to a movie. And I said, well, take me to see one. And she did. She took me to see a Western and that man got hung in the Western. And I was in the pickup bouncing along, going home. And I was crying. Mother said, sister, you got to quit that crying. And I said, well, I'm so sad that he was, she said, he made another movie. He lived. I'll take you to see it, but you got to quit that crying. <laughs> So I, I love thought, oh, that. boy, that's great. You never die in the movies. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. And I'm I'm astounded still of your mother's strength. You oh, know, doing that on her own. That just amazes me, you know, because oh, there was, was no teenager, help back then. A teenager, an Indian teenager that's with a baby. Crazy. And she would say when she went to uh <laughs> you know, job interviews and she didn't want to tell them she was Native American. So she said she was Italian. <laughs> she was dark. Her, her skin was darker and her hair was black. So she was Italian. <laughs> well, love that's that's funny. I love that. I love yeah. that. So did you take drama in high school? I did. Oh, my goodness. Was that a good fortune? You know, I just believe that the universe looks out for us. I really do. Cecil Pickett was my drama coach. And the way I got to that was they said, okay, uh, you can't go to study hall because you talk too much. And I thought, thought, oh, okay. What what else have you got? And they said, we have uh, home economics, shop, which girls couldn't take at that time, or dramatics. And I thought, well, I already know how to cook and, you know, sew. So uh, I'll, I'll take dramatics. And I went over to there. <laughs> Cecil Pickett was there. He was our uh, drama coach. And all of God, it was the best four years of my life. And all of my good, solid chums that I'm still friends with all came out of that. It was the most and later he taught at the University of Houston. He was a fabulous coach, wow. uh, a, a teacher of uh, uh, quality, of the qualities of whatever, um, uh, good writing, uh, timing, oh, timing, which cannot be taught. Uh, and But the thing that was the most wonderful thing is we got up on our feet and we started working. We did uh, scenes and we did plays. And the only way you can ever learn anything in theater is doing it because mm-hmm. nobody can, you can, they can tell you all if they want to, but boy, you know, when you're on that knife edge and you're walking it and you know when you've tipped over one way or the other because you have a connection, a visceral connection with the audience. And once that slips or your concentration slips, you have to get back on that knife edge. Walk it. It's great. It sounds like it. I mean, the just the feelings that it would bring out oh. to have that. Yeah, it was wonderful. Well, then you moved on. You started out in theater, correct? Well, Next. yes, I did. I went to Baylor University and everybody yes. said, oh, no, don't do that. But anyway, that was a great in. Uh, uh, he was uh, Paul Baker was teaching an organic way of doing things. It wasn't uh, learn your lines and learn stage left and stage right. No, no, no. It was uh, rhythm. Uh, find uh, find a rock 
or find a, a twig or something from nature and clap out the rhythm of that thing and, you know, study the color of it. And it was a new way of looking at what I was seeing all around me, a new way of looking at people, a new way of looking what motivates something. And everything has a rhythm to it. And the interesting thing is when, when you're in a scene, the scene has a rhythm and you bounce the ball back and forth to your uh, scene mate. And sometimes they can't bounce that ball back to you. Sometimes mm -hmm. the energy just comes out of their eyes to the edge of their handsome nose, falls straight up their face. You find yourself <laughs> playing tennis with yourself. You have to engineer the energy and you have to engineer the energy of the scene to the denouement and conclude it. And that gives people a a sense of fulfillment when you get of a beginning, a middle, and an end. Then they feel like they've seen something. And it shows your creativity because when it falls flat, it's up to you to kind of carry it. And sometimes with the men, you can tell that they're about, about to go up. Like if you're doing a, a scene with them, a whole scene instead of just little snippets and film, you can see because some of them break out of the sweat on their forehead. And I could tell when my partner was about to get his lives. <laughs> I love that. That's great. That's that terrible. is great. Well, we won't ask any names. <laughs> okay. No, and, and from Baylor University, I went straight into the Dallas Theater Center, which was a repertory company. Oh, repertory company. That's the most wonderful training. Because you're one night you're doing the lights for Julius Caesar and learning iambic pentameter. <laughs> and, uh, and then you're in a bustle and a tight waist and in Lady Windermere's fan, uh, you're playing a part in that show. And then the next night you're sweeping the stage floor for the other thing coming in. It was great. It was wonderful. That does. I mean, that's sort of like kind of a fun time because you're experiencing everything and then you're doing things on the fly as well. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it is. And uh, from from there uh, uh, came out to Hollywood and uh, there's not very much theater that you get paid for in Hollywood. But I did perform at the Almondson Theater, big theater. Wow. Town. And I did, a, you know, a hundred of these small theater plays. The Victory Theater here in uh, Burbank is so good. And we've done a wonderful, wonderful work there. But, you know, they give you money for gas. <laughs> but you do, that, you do that to keep your chops up and because you love it. And I right. do believe in growing your own and vegetables yes. and playwrights. You know, you have to give them a chance. And I did off-Broadway when I went to New York. I was in New York for 10 years and uh, on a, a soap opera funded it. But I went there so that I could uh, work in the theater. And I did audition for theater. And I did go out of town. We were out of town, you know, Philadelphia and Washington, D.C. at the Kennedy Center and blah, 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 blah. Nice. Damn near killed me because you'd have to come in and do your, your shows all in one day. And in those days, soaps would love to have theater people because we were good actors, you know. Right. But they would also give us an out so they would do all of our scenes in one day. And then you'd go out and work that week in Philadelphia and, and be out of town with a, oh, show out of town is hard work. Right. <laughs> uh, yeah. We're off the subject. Yes. So um, I came to Hollywood and uh, I, I worked as a, uh, secretary, mother said, mother, 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 mother. Uh, she said, fine, if you want to take a, a major in theater, then you will come home and every summer you will go to Massey's Business College downtown Houston, Texas, and you will learn to type, file, take shorthand, which I took as a foreign language, and, <laughs> and take dictation and do all the things so you can earn a living. So I I came from the Dallas Theater out to Hollywood <laughs> and I thought, oh my God, I have to get a job. So I put on my little suit and I went to interview and I got a job. I got and I typed and filed and back in the days when you had to use typewriters and four pages of carbon copy. If you make a mistake, you have to fix it. 
Oh, yeah. And there wasn't whiteout back then, I don't think. No, no I was before whiteout. <clears throat> First of all, you had to learn how to erase four copies of carbon copy. <clears throat> and then there was whiteout that you just, mm -hmm. and when they had that little ball in the typewriter, what was that called? Selectric? Yes. Oh, I thought, oh, I thought that was great because the keys didn't jam then. So, and then there was whiteout. And then I believe then, the selectric had the automatic whiteout. If you could just hit backwards or something, oh, and it would. That's right. Correct. It had that that thing on the tape of it on the mm -hmm. typewriter tape. Then there was that, and then there was um, non-carbon copies, which yes. you didn't have to put a piece of carbon paper in. So that was easier to correct. Oh my God, honey, <laughs> computers. People don't know how lucky they are. No, they really don't. I mean, I never I had to work with the typewriter, but I remember having one as a when I was a kid and playing with it. Mm. It wasn't the electric one. It was when you were talking about what if you went too fast, electric. they would get yeah. stuck. So <laughs> you have to get there and then do it. It was crazy. Oh well, my God. After that, you went, uh, I believe your first job was Ben Casey, first on screen. <laughs> Yes. Oh, my God. Yes, it was wonderful. It was like being thrown into the water and the sharks were swirling around you. Those men on those shows were like, tell you what I'm going to do. You know, uh, right. Oh, come here, cutie. Sit on my knee. Let me take you to the races. You know, oh, my right. God. <laughs> it was uh, it was amazing. Um, Fortunately, I was never asked to go to bed to get a part. And I always wondered why. <laughs> I, but, I believe it's because you're such a professional. I mean, just personally, I would think that's how I see you is because you're, you're such a professional at your craft. Yeah, I was a good actress, you know, and um, I was never asked to go to bed. I kept I thought, am I? not pretty enough you know what's going on oh and i never got cast on those shows that had all those models on it you know like the star treks and all of that i never got cast on those shows oh, <laughs> yes I everybody tried to get on star trek i think back then in the 60s yeah yeah i oh, know never happened well, well then you guest starred in many shows like gunsmoke the outcasts and hawaii 50 What's it like being on such icon iconic shows? Oh, well, so you don't know it. They're iconic. Well, when right. I take that back, you, you're just grateful for the gig, frankly, you know, uh, to get a job. But Gunsmoke, I did know that was iconic because I'm not that old. Uh, <laughs> I did know that was an iconic show and I was thrilled to be on it. Oh, my. And, you know, they're the only show that ever sent me flowers. I was the wow. leading lady of that you know that segment that episode that was the only show that sent me flowers my whole career and I've been working for 65 years you know wow wow I can't believe that yeah kind of barbers kind of the Barbara Streisand song you don't bring me flowers anymore <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> well in 1975 you landed the role of Stephanie Wyatt on search for tomorrow did you have to audition for the role uh yes yes but uh i had had uh, i had done uh days of our lives before now i was the first oh, okay. i was uh the first marie i was in the very first show oh oh yes yes, yes. here i am typing and being a receptionist and uh, my agent used to send me out oh getting an agent was hard but anyway, my agent would send me out on my lunch hour. And I went for this audition on my lunch hour. And I said to everybody, please excuse me. I have to, I'm working. I have to go back to the office. Can I go in ahead of you? <laughs> so I auditioned for it and I got it. Oh, wow. And I wow. didn't know what, I didn't know what, and they said, oh, we'd love to use you, but you have to lose that accent being from Texas. And I thought, oh, yes, we'll send you to this, uh, the speech coach and I said oh, okay so I went there a couple of times and she was very particular about speech and I thought I so I just concentrated you know but um yeah I uh and then I 
I told them at work, oh, my mother's ill. I have to go be with her in the hospital. And it'll be a week because we were going to rehearse and shoot the pilot. Well, we went over a day and I said, I'll be back on Monday, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and I had to call my mother in Houston and say, you've got to send them a telegram at work and say that you need me one more day. <laughs> and, oh, and so wow. I came back to work mm -hmm, and uh, the soul, uh, the show got sold and it was going to be. A, so uh, then I had to fess up to my employers. And one of them said, I knew you were up to something. <laughs> and, <laughs> So I trained the person for my little job uh, and I worked the until Friday before the Monday that we reported to the set and started shooting wow. Days of Our Lives. <laughs> yes, I, I'm sorry. I did skip Days of Our Lives. I, the pleasure okay. corrected me. Got me. Keep me on track. Somebody okay. has to. <laughs> and, and then we were uh, we were rehearsing a scene and um, there was a lady who was very... Uh, influential in soap operas and Erna Phillips was her name and she would uh she wasn't the uh, director uh the Cordays Betty and Ted Corday were the producers and directors of that show yes. but she was there at too because she was a wizard at soaps and she was like the the um the, the grand dame of having produced so many wonderful successful mm -hmm. soaps so she had a lectern and she would come over and her little all you'd see is her little fingers and her nose and her eyes peering over the lectern getting right close and mcdonald carrie and i were doing a scene rehearsing it sitting and i kept looking at her and i, I finally she there was a break and i said how do you work like this and he said <laughs> Just lock it in to your eyes with the other actors <laughs> and forget about them. Well, he used a four-letter word, which means a fork in the road, an Anglo-Saxon <laughs> word, so beginning with F, and forgot about them. So that's what I, that was the best advice I ever got. Lock it in. Because when you're working in television or film, people only see your face on the screen. But over here, there's an army of machines and people and grips jingling the change in their pockets you know? <laughs> yes oh i don't know how anybody does it wow and you did that off and on that role for off and on until 2010 i believe when it well i was on the show for about 10 years and then uh, my character had done uh, being young I was the victim in everything you know miscarriage right. and bad marriage and marriage to the wrong person and uh, the uh, brother home from the war and uh, plastic surgery and we didn't recognize him nor he remember us he had amnesia and I fall in love with my brother and have to go away when I find out to Africa as a medical missionary, come back as a raving nun into <laughs> a cat, uh, this Protestant family, this Catholic nun. It's very strange. And, <laughs> <laughs> but I got to pick the habit because mother at one time had put me into an orphanage, uh, which was, you know, uh, safe, that she thought. Right. And um, the Sisters of the Immaculate Heart, uh, I knew their habit very well because they come nuns come in two flavors very mm -hmm. nice are not so nice so <laughs> hold out your hands so uh but that was interesting uh, yes and I played that for a long time and then later on in my career when I was back in Los Angeles um you know McDonald Carey passed away and soaps are the only venue that you can go to a beloved friend's funeral twice <laughs> you can go That's to his real funeral and then they have a funeral for him on the show and they invited me back because the person playing marie was unavailable at the time and you get to go to his funeral on camera and i did that with francis reed too who played mm -hmm. my mother my goodness what a tribute what i owe to those two what i owe to francis reed she was, I uh, was so young on that show. 
in my 20s, and she was the epitome of a lady in the theater. Yes. And she, when I would do something, she would say, Marie, don't give actresses a bad name. And, <laughs> you know, but she she knew how to, even at the, we used to rehearse, even at the rehearsal table, when she would read a script, I would be very moved by her reading because she never stinted, but it looked like she didn't do anything. Right. And that was one of the greatest compliments I ever got from a, a kid who was playing. <laughs> He said, Marie, you just make it look so damn easy. And I thought. And you, and you do, because you, you, every role, it doesn't matter whether it's Baskets, Days of Our Lives, you make that role you and you own it. Yeah. And, and, and it's great. It's, <laughs> it's such professional. I mean. That's the fun of it. Yeah. And then you yeah. went on to, to search for tomorrow, correct? Oh, yeah. Well, and then I was off days of our lives and uh, somebody said they're casting this role but they think that you're not right for it and I said oh really mm. why and uh and uh, then I had uh, gone from a brunette to a blonde and I lost you know my baby fat my weight and I said if you can get me an audition I'll prove them wrong <laughs> They did. Got an audition. Went to New York. I got to stay at the plaza. I'd always wanted wow. to stay at the plaza. And fortunately, I had a friend in New York in the theater, and uh, he would come in and rehearse the scene with me. So that was very good. So yes, I I auditioned for it, and the director finally came to me after the audition on on tape and said what are you doing auditioning for that song? I said, what are you doing directing it? You know, I need the money. <laughs> I went to New York. I was so stony broke. I had to borrow $500 from my agent for cash, you know, in hand. And I paid him back, but I was, oh, that was so funny. Uh, search for tomorrow, Mary Stewart. Well, I was hired to be the femme fatale, you know, the lady who did all the wrong things before the yes. right and, uh, you know, she had a child that she wanted to pass off as somebody's child. And she was finagling this and finagling that. It was wonderful. I loved playing that character. But my first day, I was freezing. I was a kid, you know, from California. I came to New York. It was the winter time. Oh, man. Uh, and I finally got a pair of, uh, I came with open-toed shoes. I bought a pair of boots. I went into the shoemaker. I put them on the counter and I said, put some soles on these boots so I can walk around on this ice, please. Thank you. So I went into NBC on uh, 65th, 57th Street. And um, it was freezing, freezing in that big building. So I brought in my, my fluffy bedroom slippers. And in those days you had to go in. The first thing you did was go into hair and makeup and they would put these curlers in your hair. And here's me schlumping around with these <laughs> big fluffy uh, feet. And Mary Stewart looked at me and she said, this is our sex symbol. Because I had oh, no. curlers in my hair and my glitters. <laughs> I said, I'm freezing to death here. You know? And oh, then, then we were rehearsing a scene and I felt this rumble, rumble, rumble. You know, the building kind of did this. And I dove under a desk and they said, what the hell are you doing, Marie? And I said, there's an earthquake. Didn't you feel it? Didn't you? <laughs> it's built on top of the subway. And the building, <laughs> the building vibrates when the trains go by. Well, who knew? I didn't know. I'm, you know, I was so, I was so silly. <laughs> yeah, but you came from California where it wasn't silly, Dad. Of course. Protect yourself. <laughs> oh, my gosh. So, yeah, that was Search for Tomorrow, and I loved every minute playing that show. That was a good show. I didn't get see all of it, but I caught, I think, the last part at uh -huh. the but because uh, I came in a little late. <laughs> oh, that's okay. Um, and that's when I would I would go out and I would uh, audition for plays. And so I did I did off Broadway. I was up in Playwrights Horizons, and uh, and then as I said in those days, they really liked theater actors because uh, 
you know, we were good. And uh, they would allow us time to uh, go to auditions. And on, if you were in a show, they would tape you early on Wednesday so that you could get out and go do your matinee. Wow. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, to me, that says a lot about a professional actor or actress um, is the theater. They yeah. always get drawn back to the theater yeah. because it's just so much. I mean, not yeah. that the this in films or TV is just there's you get so much from the audience and being there from what oh, I've yeah. heard. True story. It, yes. Um, let's see. Then you were there for 10 years. In 1987, you joined, I believe it was Port Charles first. No, it was General, General Hospital, Hospital first. first because <clears throat> the producer. Oh, uh, before that, uh, uh, Joanna Lee had produced Search for Tomorrow for a couple of years. And then she came out. And when I came out to California, she said, would you like to go back to work? And I said, sure. So she cast me in one of her afternoon specials as a lady who was, you know, one of those wonderful characters of being very, very mean or very strict, I should say. But then uh, one of our uh, producers was then uh, producing, one of our writers had edged up to writing, I think, uh, General Hospital. And she contacted me and Wes Kenny, uh, a wonderful producer, uh, invited me to be on General Hospital to play Aunt Charlene, which I loved. Charlene. She was this kind of woman. She, oh, goody. She was from Oklahoma. And she would <laughs> say, well, if you saw it, why'd you step in it? <laughs> Things like that. And I loved playing her. She wore all the wrong things and said all the wrong things. <laughs> She was, and I loved, I just love playing characters. They're just so ever so much more interesting. Well, you, I mean, you, in General Hospital, I know you acted with some of the great actors there. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. all of your shows, but we're getting to where I'm more familiar. Oh, um, yeah. And Lynn Herring, I just love her. And uh, just wonderful, wonderful people. And then they did a, another spinoff, which was called Port Charles. And I went over there and then the uh, producer came back that everyone feared. Oh, this was so interesting. She shall remain nameless, but she invited all the cast members of different families uh, of one evening to either drinks or dinner. And my family unit was in the drinks portion. So I thought, oh, <laughs> and uh, so, yes, indeed, at that, and then the, and the people in the dinner portion, you know, would come later. So, yes, indeed, she said, she announced, I am, dis- I'm uh, terminating your contracts because I didn't, you know, create any of your characters. And I thought, I was at the end of the table and I said, oh, excuse me, I didn't hear you. Does that mean that we're fired? And she said, yes, dear. And I said, oh, excuse me. I have to go call my agent. And I got up and left the table because, you know, when you've got news, you're going to be, you're fired. Why sit around? (laughs) Right. For sure. (laughs) So we were all fired. (laughs) Mm. That's crazy. Yeah, it is. But that's the way it goes. Yeah. I, I, I know it is just from hearing different stories and situations. And this is the only business that you can get rewarded for being, you know, uh, for uh, changing employment. You have to have a lot of shows on your resume. So, yeah. Yes. Well, you've been in soaps for a very long time. Where do you see the future of soaps going? Do you Uh, think they're... You see, I don't... (laughs) The only thing, the only thing different about soaps and nighttime or movies is that you get to do a whole scene. It's rather like theater. You have a beginning, a middle, and an end that you play. And there are three cameras around that they cut back and forth so that they can tend, you know, when you're doing a one camera thing like television, well, there's some television and and film, is uh, you do a one camera setup and, and they look at you and then they look over your shoulder and do your point of view on the other person. Well, that requires a whole different setup. Right. So you don't get to do a whole scene. You do 
snippets of your lines and then you do snippets of your lines with you know, with their face on the camera well but but in soaps you do a whole scene it's just it's wonderful right but, um uh as far as i have seen there isn't much difference in the in the writing except that you don't have to do all that repetition. And now in right. soaps, there is this terrific moment when you when you're in the middle of a scene and you go in your mind, you know, you have to keep blah, 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 doing the scene, but in your mind, you're going, Oh my goodness, is this what I said yesterday, what I'm supposed to be saying today, or what I will say tomorrow? So I quit right. reading scripts ahead just to see if you're gonna be killed. You know, you see what happened to that. But uh, yeah, and I learned my lines in the bathtub because there's no <laughs> interruption there. So the scripts are always <laughs> soggy and water labeled. <laughs> but um, as far as I can tell, as far as the storyline goes, it's very little difference between the writing in daytime and nighttime, frankly. It's Ooh. just, you know, somebody killed somebody and somebody blew up a car, maybe. Uh, that's the difference. But um, the interesting thing is in theater, you can give vent. Yes. Television, you have body language, but it's restricted. In film, you have the movement of an eye to say what you want to say. Right. Aha! Uh -huh. Because you have it's so restricted that your emotions are seen and you better be thinking those thoughts. <laughs> For <laughs> sure. They're going to come out you. <laughs> well, speaking of primetime, you've not only you've done several primetime shows, uh, just to go through a few of the amazing roles, you were on Knott's Landing, oh. uh, where you tell everybody you're Laura's mom and <laughs> How was that? What was that one like? <laughs> well, you see, you don't know you're being in an iconic show, but you're just like, grateful for the gig. So, uh, I love playing that character because she did, you know, all the wrong things, but for the right mm -hmm. reasons. And she wanted the money or the child, and she didn't care which, you know. And yes. I just loved it. And I was killed, and I was eating a fig Newton when I got shot. And I always I love getting shot and falling down because you have to learn the ball, you know. But I I just thought it was so funny to have that big Newton with a bio. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is that sounds great. I mean, yeah. that cul-de-sac has a lot. I have a lot of memories with that cul-de-sac. Not so. Oh but. yeah. Oh yeah. Was, oh, listen, we, it was so hot one day, and I wore these big silver cuffs. I was so glad I had them on because I could put them in the ice water and put the cuffs back on. And you know, you have uh, your blood is thin in your wrists and around your neck. So I was constantly uh, trying to cool myself down because you can't sweat the makeup runs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> wow. Well, then you've done other shows like The Has and the Have Nots. Oh. Which is one of my favorites by Tyler Perry. Tyler Perry. May he. I just think he's marvelous. Yes, he works very fast. Fast. And that was the reason, you know, being in a soap, you have to do it. Uh, when I started out in soaps, there was no fix it and post. If the camera hit a piece of the scenery, and you saw the wall move, maybe they would stop and take it over. There was no fixing it in post. There was no post. You know, you just did it. Uh, and then they put it up on the air. But so you you learned to get it right the first time. And my last scene was kind of, it was pretty emotional. And um, I came out and he hugged me and he said, oh, Miss Pearl. He, he said, <laughs> Uh, and you did it in one take. That was his highest compliment. <laughs> oh, I love that. I love him. I love him. He does. It's fast, and it, you got to be it, that deliver it, and do it. You know, and he really values that. I love him. 
and in that show, he's also uh, the smartest man I ever worked for. I mean, good heavens. He bought that oh, decommissioned yes. army base, gave part of that property to the city for a park, and he has built he's built an empire to make movies. And I just adore him. Yes. And, and I'm glad to hear that, you know, that it's not all in Hollywood now that now they're starting to do studios yeah, in glad. other places. I'm glad, yeah. Now I was just gonna say, you know, the character that you play, uh, you had a lot of issues thrown at you from your nephew that that is prevalent in the news today and i just i loved that i loved how yeah. you, how that was approached in there and dealt yeah with that and i played the old line uh the hard line old line old-fashioned lady you know yes uh, which you know you may you may and and that's an interesting thing i always play people I, well i play a lot of people that i don't disagree i don't agree with you know but i think that's what being an actress is you play these ladies uh who are that's different from you yeah for sure for sure long with working with tower Perry, you worked with another amazing amazing actor who's you know just incredible you worked alongside louis on baskets oh who louis oh louis anderson louis anderson oh yes i was his good friend what a generous kind human being human he being. was I, I I loved everything he was in. I mean, he he was oh. he was just marvelous. Now we share something too. We share thin optics. See, this is my telephone, and here is on the back is where this lives. A little Paul Snay. Look at this. Oh, well, it's it that neat. And so I can read my the la 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 la. And when I take it off, I put it here. Well, he had the same thing. And we used <laughs> oh, cool. to around, you know, Paul snaying each other. Yeah. Uh, and, oh, this is an interesting thing. There are some shows in television that you have to say the lines as written. Right. They make a religion of it. Okay, I can do that. But then I'm really concentrating on is it the or Anne? You know, and, and God forbid you should give me numbers because I cannot remember numbers. I have to write them on something. I used to put them in the bottom of the coffee cup and then the prop man would put coffee in it, you know. <laughs> uh, and in one show, uh, I was uh, had all the medical jargon and I put the names in great big type and pasted it because uh, I was giving uh, testimony in a court, I pasted it under, you know, at the uh, where I could see, you know, the modesty panel when people go to testify in court, they sit mm -hmm. and they have a modesty panel. Mm -hmm. And then I found out that they came out with these things on, on iPads that has the script on it. And the star of the show was looking down at, like he was looking at his notes. He was reading his line <laughs> from that damn thing. And I said, that's not fair. That I have to learn all this medical jargon. And you're, you're the lines. Well, legal and medical jargon would be so hard for anybody to uh, figure out. And you just made me think, I did actually realize it until you said, this, said that about the iPad. A lot of times you see lawyers, they'll walk back to the table while they're talking, they'll be like looking at their notes. Yeah. I wonder, uh -huh. I wonder if that's what they're really doing. They've got the script in their iPad, you know, and they're looking <laughs> at it. And one time, uh, Cagney and Lacey, uh, and I've forgotten which of the girls looked at me. I had all the uh, the scientific jargon about nuclear fission and blah, 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 blah. And it could be, you know, you could use it to make a dirty bomb. And one of them looked up and said, better you than me. <laughs> Oh, God almighty, you have to say all this jargon, you know? Yeah. That, that was a good show, too. I, I remember oh, watching that every, yeah. every week, too. Yeah. Um, well, along with all that we've already discussed, you have starred in many films like Beetlejuice, The Wedding Singer, A Night at the Roxbury, <laughs> Mr. and Miss Smith, plus many, many more. As a legend, what's it like working alongside such incredible talent? Uh, with what? Working alongside like, such new, incredible talent, you know, like. Well, sometimes it can be a little intimidating, like, oh, well, Beetlejuice is my very favorite. Uh, everything is my, my favorite role is the one I'm working on at the moment. Correct. Generally, you know, so 
Beetlejuice. I just loved that character and I love <laughs> his wife. Robert Goulet, when I first was my first day there, you know, he came walking across the set in his Ru uh, Goulet Rue role. You know, hello, I'm Robert yes. Goulet. And he went to kiss my hand and I said, oh, Nikki says, sends her best. I had worked with his daughter in New York on Search for Tomorrow. Oh, really? How is she? You know, then he just dropped all that facade and he became this kid from Canada and he smoked these awful cigars and he would leave the butt oof, where I would find it and I would take it and leave it where he would find it. And then we did that all through <laughs> doing Beetlejuice. And finally, on the last day, he thought he had won. He put it on the handle of my car. So I packed it up and sent it to him in his Las Vegas address. <laughs> it's just these little things that will get you through the day, you know. And we, For sure. we, we had seen the uh, prosthetics and we were kind of confused. We didn't know it was a takeoff. Nobody told us. So uh, we thought, well, you know, I don't know about this film. The prosthetics aren't very good. So we played traveling games on the set, you know, these word games. I'm going to Paris and I'm taking an A, you know, what that game is. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but uh, I, yes, I've worked with some wonderful people, but if you're good, if, if you do your job and you have something of interest that they, uh, if they're generous of nature, they relate to that. You know, actors yes. relate to uh, quality, frankly. Mm -hmm. But some yeah. people don't or don't give you a chance. Like when you're in a movie and, you, and you're saying your lines and you're playing a part that isn't like up in, you know, the first listing, um, I have worked with some people who will not stand to the right of the camera so that you can say their lines to a real person and, you know, get their reaction. And so you can relate to that person. I have said my lines to the first AD, uh, a man, oh. uh, a 20 year old or a second, you know, 30 year old man with a beard when I'm talking to a woman. <laughs> Very interesting. Well, <laughs> That's my generosity of spirit well, you made me think of something i don't understand how actors and actresses do it because you know i have a little camera here yeah but i've tried looking in it and talking to it as like i'm talking to i just can't do it well you have to look to the either side of it you know and uh, yeah i have a tendency to look at, at the bobbing head on the <laughs> on the um the computer and so i i sometimes think i'm looking i don't know i don't, can't see well enough to see if i'm looking down <laughs> well, I, often, I often hope my guests don't think i'm looking away from them because yeah. i'm looking at them on my at screen them. me too yeah uh -huh. i'm just open god don't think i'm being disrespectful i'm not yeah <laughs> But, you know, the, the actors that I respect the most are people who can create these fabulous, outrageous characters, and you believe them. I have worked, it seems to me, I have lived all of my life longing for these character roles, these character roles, because you can get your teeth into them, you know. Right. It's a, But I, I want to play them with... Uh, with the minimal of fuss, uh, Kenneth Branagh comes to mind. And you know how he's so contained. Oh, I just watched yes. Wolf Hall and Mark Rylance played Thomas Cromwell. Yes. Honest to God, I don't think he moved his facial muscles very much. I And I glom on and hone in and study these very confined performances and you can you can read what he is thinking through his tension and his body muscles and he doesn't move very much on his face and right. Kenneth Branagh is like that too and David Suchet is another actor like that I just I love these people um and I want I want to grow up to be Judy Dench <laughs> oh, I love Judy Dench. Oh, what? I love her. She and Joan, these wonderful women, Joan Hickson and uh, 
uh, who's this other lady? I have to read there. Geraldine McEwen. Now, Geraldine McEwen has a couple of uh, uh, little quirks that she'll do, <laughs> which I do sometimes, you know. <laughs> she'll finish a line and go, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, you know. <laughs> I, just, I I love playing these characters, and at last I'm of an age that I can play uh, with a gray wig. I always use a gray wig now because it, uh, it, 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 I'm in my 80s. Ha <laughs> ha! You do not look it at all. Uh, you do not look it. In my you'd 80s. Be, I... You'd be the perfect actress to do a show where it's a an older lady, but then you do flashbacks play younger, and yeah. you could play younger. You could play both yeah. roles. And I'm still auditioning for like sixties, you know, and, uh, and stuff. But when my wear my gray wig and it gives gravitas to my, you know, to what I'm doing, but it's, it's wonderful to don that wig. And with that wig comes the, uh, the weight of years. You know, it's, it's um, I seem to be older when I put the wig on it. I love being this age because I generally get to play roles of older women doing things that younger women would do or unexpected things that older. And I just did an uh, Alaska Air uh, campaign of a, uh, a grandmother uh, who uh, has a, a young lover, and she said, you should see my DMs. <laughs> and I didn't know what that meant because <laughs> I'm on Facebook and people DM me, but, you know, but evidently uh, men uh, hit on women on their DMs. DMs. Well, I didn't know that. <laughs> and then the line <laughs> made sense, you know. <laughs> Oh, See, wow. I don't say DM, I say messenger, messenger or text, but I knew what a DM was. It's, I, don't, I don't know why well, I never used DM. And I didn't, I didn't look at the messages very much because I thought, well, you know, the government reads them. And so I don't do very much on that because uh, so, I'm, I'm suspicious. I think the government is into right. everything. You know? So I didn't know what that was. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I'll tell you. I think they're called anagrams. I hate people like uh, BRB means be right back or, uh, you know, the little. Oh, I can't, I, I can't keep up. And it's, it's, uh, it's all these uh, agencies and everything that have initials. You know, I never know what they are. I never know what Me. they are because there are too many of them. Right. Um, mm -hmm. Well, my family. I, did, I didn't start using an emoji of a little red car until someone pointed it out to me, you know, because I drive a little red car. And you know, if I say I'm on my way, I can just poke the little red car. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm just now using hashtags the last couple of years. I'm, you know, I still forget to do it a lot of times. Uh, I have to get bone up on that. And I have to get better at, um, at, uh, in Instagram, I'm a little afraid of TikTok because the Chinese government, I've, I've heard, collects all of our information. But I worked with a couple of people who were hired because they were TikTok influencers. And yes. one of them said, oh, honey, he said, the U.S. government has all of our information. I'm more afraid of them than I am of the CCP. And I thought, oh, <laughs> oh, OK. <laughs> But I have to do this for my pottery. Oh, yes. And how do I keep my sanity? Mm -hmm. I go throw a pot. I'm a potter in my yes. free time. And I have an extensive garden. I, ra I garden in raised beds so I don't have to bend over that far. Um, and I was just out there um, thinning out my radishes. And I take them up and I pinch off their little toes. And I save the leaves uh, and put them in my salad because they're peppery. Really? I didn't know you could eat those. I mean, I didn't know it would hurt you, but I didn't know that it was. I'm going to have to try that because I love radishes. I love radishes. Well, um, and you can boil the the leaves of radishes if they're, you know, fresh. Uh, just rinse off the, uh, the sand and boil them up and you eat them with greens. 
and uh, when I make chicken broth, I just now sometimes you you buy radishes and they're kind of wilted. Uh, the greens are wilted. So I just snap those off and freeze them. And when I boil chicken bones, I make my own chicken broth. I throw everything in the refrigerator that I've saved, onion skins, any kind of peelings. Yeah. You save all of that stuff put it in the broth, put it and boil it for a couple of days. And all of the goodness that was in the skins that we throw away, which has all the nutrient in it, then mm -hmm. you have that in your chicken broth. And then you freeze it up in little packets like snack bags. And then you have enough chicken broth to make a soup. I'm going to have to do that. Thank you for that <laughs> advice. I, 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 I throw the onion peels away all the time. All the time. I've never really it's very them. interesting because you know, I come full circle. I'm from a farm or a ranch, and I we had always had a chicken, uh, a chicken garden, a kitchen garden, mm -hmm. and I have come back to it. I grow most of the greens that we eat, and um, I grow my onions and garlic, and everywhere I can now. I look to say, gee, I wonder if I could fit a raised bed in there, you know. <laughs> Oh, I love that because I too come from a farm, but I come from a beef farm. So, you know, oh. I about beef, I could tell you a little more than I could about vegetables, but I still grow my own tomatoes every summer. I mean, I, yeah, I mean, Kentucky, yeah. so I can't do anything during the winter. But have I love you ever fresh bought a tomato that tasted like a tomato? Oh, only from the farmer's market. Yeah. When well, it's grown yeah. local, that's it. Now, you can take store bought tomatoes and put them in a brown bag for a day or two, sealed up, and it will help a little bit. Yeah, with flavor, but once they're refrigerated, it's hard to get them to continue to ripen. It's true. Yeah. But yeah. I, I'm with you. I love vegetables, but I'm a beef person. <laughs> 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 and speaking of your ceramics, you do make ceramics and you make them all yourself, right? Oh, yes. I throw uh, things on the wheel. Now, I've taken up China painting in my old age because I wanted another expression. Now, when I throw something, Oh, I wish I had pictures to show you. Uh, I throw something and I uh, I embellish it with a, an image and I underglaze paint it and then put a clear glaze over it and fire it. That's one way. Wow. And then a uh, china painting, you form the object, you glaze it, and then you can paint on the outside and then uh, fire it. And it's it's another expression. Uh, sometimes I, I do have on the Etsy account, I have a lot of things that I, China uh, porcelain blanks that I bought and I've painted them and fired them and put them up there. But on the Marie Cheatham, uh dot com forward slash ceramics, I have things that I've thrown and also on the Ventura Guild of Ventura Potter's Guild online, I have my uh, wheel thrown and hand um, uh, sculpted objects. So, and and I have embellished them with underglaze paint or china paint, depending on what I'm doing. And I've fallen in love with hollyhocks all over again. So I'm doing a hollyhock series. Hollyhock. Would you like me to send you some pictures so that you can in intersperse or do you do Absolutely. that? Absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, okay. I can put them in. And, and if you all are interested, Marie has an Etsy shop, like she said, and I've got the link to her Etsy shop in our description of this video. She's got some beautiful art there. Thank you. <laughs> I love it. I, I loved it. I really do. Well, um, it's a big challenge. And, <laughs> and it, it, it's, uh, it's my san always has been my sanity saver uh, when I was able to, to, uh, to do this. Well, I think my hour with you is up. I don't want to take up too much more of your time. I appreciate you so much being here, Miss Cheatham. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, you're wonderful to do these, these, these interviews because you get to really get to know people that you like. Yes. And I try to ask questions about, like, I did the very first question, you know, your childhood. I'm not looking for dirt. I'm just asking questions that most people don't ask. I mean, I like That's to know right. if you have a sibling or not their name, but you grew yeah. up alone or. Uh, well, you get to know people who've been in your living room all of your life. <laughs> yes. Yes. And, and you said something earlier and I did want to add to that about there's not much difference between prime time and daytime. As far as the writing, the biggest difference is daytime comes in your home five days a week. So yeah. they become part of your family. Yeah. 
That's an interesting yeah. point because when you are a, a little image and you're in a person's living room day to, you know, breakfast, whatever, they're diapering their children or, you know, cleaning the house or wherever they see you, they're familiar with you. But when you're a big image that you see on the screen, maybe once every couple of years, it's a different thing. So that when I see people out and about, they'll say, oh, 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 I know you. Did we go to school with each other or you know, you, they're familiar with you yes. and they feel they can approach you. But when you see somebody that you've seen on a movie screen, it's a different relationship, you know. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, again, I thank you for being here so much. And I, I hope you'll wait in the waiting room for just a couple of minutes and I'll get back there. I've got something I want to talk to you about. You might. OK. If you have a couple of minutes. Thank sure. you so much. I'll be back there in just a couple of minutes. OK. I'd like to thank Mary Cheatham for being here today. I'd like to thank the Necrotizing Fasciitis Foundation for sponsoring our show. For more information on Necrotizing Fasciitis, please visit www.necfasci.org. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel for more upcoming videos. And remember to be kind to one another. Until next time, have a great day.